Welcome to the Too Long Didn't Read Book Club. Tonight's title, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling by Ross King. From 1508 to 1512, over the course of four mercilessly grueling years, what may be art's greatest undertaking was completed by a man whose name would subsequently become synonymous with artistic greatness. And, yes, with nuclearly mutated turtles, who also happened to be trained ninjas. Don't worry, we're going to cover that. He had battled bureaucrats, other artists, the weather, supply issues, and gone head-to-head with the most powerful man in the Western world, the Pope, numerous times over this period. He tasted torment and triumph all along the way, but even today, over 500 years since its completion, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, located in Vatican City, Italy, has drawn crowds and stirred imaginations. It is a testament to heaven itself, achieved only through great striving and unshakable faith. It also bears witness to the visionary, leadership, and creative genius possessed by the man behind its creation, Michelangelo. Born in 1475, the eldest son to a middle-class family in Florence, Italy, Michelangelo di Lodovici Buonatari, wait, Michelangelo di Lodovico Buonatari, Bu, Buonarati, Simone. Michelangelo di Lodovico Buonarati, Simone. That's the best I can do. Had chosen to be an artist against the wishes of his father who believed it a trade below the status of the family who, he often reminded Michelangelo, was a descendant of Italian nobility. Despite our contemporary assumptions of Renaissance artists as freelancing, celebrated geniuses, creating works that stirred their respective souls and through either merit, happenstance, or both, happened to make them extraordinarily wealthy and famous. The truth is, as is so often the case, far less glamorous. Michelangelo and the vast majority of his cohorts were seen, no matter their talent, as contractors. They worked at the behest of the upper-class clientele with the means and desire to hire them. However, within the bounds of these confines, they were free to explore and expand their creative predilections. In this world that existed in the middle ground between artistic freedom and capitalistic incentive, Michelangelo found a foothold as a young apprentice and had managed to thrive. Essentially, he was sort of a boy wonder who had marveled the who's who of the art world by the time he was in his early 20s. By the time Michelangelo had reached his early 30s, he had not only built quite the reputation about town, but had availed himself as a top talent, a rare genius hampered more by his difficult temperament than by any demands on his creative ability. However, his next project would certainly be his most demanding yet. In the year 1505, Michelangelo would be summoned to the Vatican. This is actually for the second time because he was hired to work on the Pope's uh, mausoleum first, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Though this was a thousand years after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Rome's preeminence as an artistic destination was second to none. Because in Rome, housed within the mysterious confines of the Vatican, lay the world's most influential client. As the title suggests, this book revolves around two central characters. One is Michelangelo, the other is the Pope. And to understand this story, you must understand not only the Pope, but the papacy, and what it meant to the whole of Europe at this point in history. The Sistine Chapel would be completed in 1512, a full five years before Martin Luther's 95 Theses initiated the schism that would cause an as yet unbridged gap in Christendom. This means, essentially, that with the exception of Greek and Russian Orthodox practitioners, to name a few, 
essentially all other professed Christians in the world, which is essentially to say all of Europe, were Catholic. And thus, in 1512, the Pope was, for all intents and purposes, the most powerful man on the continent, if not the world. While today we colloquially picture the Roman pontiff as an aged, benevolent, grandfatherly figure, content to make the rare public appearance and we assume live in either perpetual piety or incomparable opulence or maybe both, but the Pope that Michelangelo had encountered, that the Pope that Michelangelo worked for, was not this. Pope Julius II was an Italian by birth who was known as the Warrior Pope. He was Pope for a little over a decade, from 1503 until 1513, and he chose his papal name not in honor of Pope Julius I, but in emulation of Julius Caesar. Think about that for a second. In short, he was not a great guy and a nightmare to work for. He was an egomaniac, obsessed with his own legacy, who had been the nephew of a previous Pope and is seen to be the beneficiary of deeply ensconced nepotism more so than the dignified vicar of Christ. To be sure, Pope Julius II shows us that the successor of Peter through the apostolic lineage of the Catholic Church is still a human being, as fraught with inequities and faults as the rest of us. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, depending on one's perspective, Julius II's particular personal shortcomings would not bode well for his relationship with the young, fiery, and at times difficult, but undeniably genius Florentine. Julius II had originally hired Michelangelo to construct the mausoleum in which he planned to lie in permanent repose. This, in short, did not go as swimmingly as one might hope. However, it did not dissuade the Pope from calling on Michelangelo when he decided the most constructive way to remedy a cracked ceiling in the Sistine Chapel was to construct a 3D ascending vision of heaven, repeat with biblical imagery and done in the most difficult, most permanent medium possible for a painter, fresco. In fresco painting, wet plaster is applied to a wall, and the artist must paint directly onto that plaster while it's still wet. When done correctly, it infuses the paint into the actual plaster, creating not only a unique but permanent work in which the subjects are actually a part of the structure. This would be a monumental task for any painter, but therein lies the catch in this monumental endeavor. Michelangelo is really more of a sculptor, but there was one thing that Michelangelo and Julius did agree on. Michelangelo was the right man for this job. Oftentimes, great art is born of struggle, born of conflict. And eternal art, as the Sistine Chapel not only turned out to be, but was intended to be, may well require both struggle and great conflict. It certainly did in this case. And we haven't even mixed the paint up yet. Just you wait. That does it for part one of Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling by Ross King. Tune in for part two about how Michelangelo was asked by the Pope himself to do the impossible and actually managed to do it. If you have read this title or you think you could have done a better job on the Sistine Chapel, let us know in the comments. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and click the notification bell so you're alerted as soon as we post new content. And that's pretty often, so you don't want to miss out. Until then, be sure to check out all of our other titles and tune in for part two of the Too Long Didn't Read Book Club's reading of Michelangelo and the Pope by Ross King. Next time, only here on the Too Long Didn't Read Book Club.